gentlemen, thank you so much. I hope you got everything you wanted out of that 10 minute break, the caffeine, the donuts, the denunciations of Will Hoyt, whatever you needed. I know I was uh, awkwardly trying to hear David Schindler and Will Hoyt discuss, um, because that definitely seems to be the, the mashup that the world needs. Uh, unfortunately, David's leaving us before the last panel, so I can't stick him on there, but it's fine. Well, Chad told me he likes long, uh, short introductions, not long ones. So I'll just say he's been called one of the four horsemen of the post-liberal apocalypse, but don't believe the hype. He's a great guy, a great dad, dealing with twins, doing the best he can. Come on up, Chad. That's, that's a perfect introduction, thank you. Um, that, that pretty much sums it up. Um, I have to begin by saying how grateful I am, not because that's what I'm supposed to say, but I actually am really grateful to be here. I have been, at least notionally, on the Board of Advisors for New Polity since its inception, uh, though I noticed that they never asked for my advice. <laughs> um, I, it's also true that I have newborn twins, which is why I also have to apologize for uh, changing the title of this talk on you because uh, when I was initially asked um, I decided to give uh, the first thing that came to my mind which was a paper that I'd already published and then I realized that actually they would like for these talks to be published in new polity so I couldn't quite give you that um, and so uh, then I discovered not only did you want it to be published but the theme was on tyranny and I hadn't written the other thing on tyranny so I had to write a new talk, and so this is uh, something uh, that I've done for New Polity and for you today, specifically on tyranny in Plato and Augustine. Um, I don't have a title for it, a new title, uh, but for purposes of focusing your attention, I'll just call it uh, Conforming Our Souls to the City. This conference raises questions about tyranny that I would like to answer primarily and substantially through the ancient world rather than through looking at our contemporary scene, as tempting as it is. I don't want to ad address the question of tyranny immediately, but I'll soon get there. What I want to first address is the ancient question of the relationship between our souls and cities. First, I'll examine the likeness that holds between the human soul and the human city in the eighth book of Plato's Republic. And then I'll turn to Augustine's rather platonic insight in the second book of the City of God, and later in the fifth book, namely that our souls conform to what we see in the city. Our souls conform to what we gaze at, if you will, what we behold. And this, in turn, raises the question of our worship. In the final section of my talk, I'll fast forward to our contemporary world and our contemporary tyrannies and the question of how Christians can be destroyers of the gods once again in a world which has gone woke. What I have to say about Plato and Augustine substantially, I hope, will help us pay closer attention to the city which threatens our soul. Uh, I'll conclude with the necessity, of course, of the rightly ordered gaze of true religion. First. Men who are like their regimes. In Plato's Republic, we learn about men who are like their, regi their regimes. What makes a human being like their regime? What connects the soul to the city? Human beings are social and political by nature. Aristotle teaches us correctly, I think. So it stands to reason that the social and political communities they found will reflect something of their soul. In turn, the communities that humans found will also shape them. The relationship between soul and city then in the ancient world is understood to be intimate. If the city is good, it conduces to the good of souls. If the city is bad, so bad for the soul. Plato takes us through three kinds of men who are like their regime oligarchic man, democratic man, and tyrannical man. And we learn how the ultimate aim of each progressively leads to self-destruction of souls and cities alike. We learn of oligarchy, that money is the ultimate value for both this city and the person who is like it. We're thinking of Jacob's talk yesterday. 
To become a ruler in an oligarchy demands something of the human soul who so desires to exercise their political agency. The oligarchic regime shapes the human soul to pursue the ideal of wealth, cultivating greed in the intimate chambers of the heart. The overriding aim is no longer self-discipline or self-governance in an oligarchy, but now is a kind of lust for possession, for material wealth. This produces disorder and instability in soul and city alike, and in so is very easily turned against itself. It's unstable. It doesn't have integrative stability. And that leads to class wars. Plato considers that the reaction to the oligarchic disorder, this is somewhat different than Aristotle's view, but nevertheless intelligible, that the reaction to the oligarchic disorder is likely to be democratic man. Since great inequalities of wealth in the oligarchic regime demand a revolution and what is most highly valued and even worshiped. Here the praise of wealth is upended by the worship of equality, like we heard in the last talk. We learn of democracy that freedom and equality are thus the ultimate values, the principles worth gazing at. The reputation of the democratic city is that it is full of freedom and there is liberty in it for anyone who to do anything he wants, Plato writes. Democracy has the reputation of being the most attractive re of regimes because in a democracy each person can arrange his life within the city in whatever way he pleases, like Wendell Berry on his farm. In the short term, at least, this may hold. But in the long term, this is also a recipe for disaster. In particular, it is a recipe for the same kind of oppressive habits which developed within oligarchic man, pitting every class against the other. In this sense, Plato sees oligarchy and democracy as intimately related despite having different ultimate values because democracy is, in Plato's view, born out of oligarchy and is destined to produce the same kind of disorder in the soul as it does in the city, where faction and counterfaction inevitably arise in a dialectic. As the oligarchic desires are replaced by the democratic desires, the self-discipline which was once ordered to the thriftiness required for producing wealth will now be viewed as miserly and selfish. There will be a kind of religious purging of the oligarchic values and souls will be initiated with new solemn rites that turn insolence into sophistication, that calls anarchy freedom, that calls decadence generosity, that calls shamelessness, Plato writes, courage. Yet in this transvaluation of all values, the democratic man does not cease to be oligarchic man for he carries on valuing the money required for necessary desires and values freedom for his unnecessary desires. Since all the pleasures of democratic man now sit on equal footing, he will insist that we refuse the distinction between good and evil desires, since all desires are equal and must be valued equally. In both cases, Plato writes, the thing which formed the basis of the regime, wealth or freedom, produced something self-destructive for the city and the person alike. For the person who is like the city, especially. And this same self-destructive tendency is also evidence in the reaction to democracy. For, quote, chances are that democracy is the ideal place Democracy is the ideal place to find the origin of tyranny. Welcome to America. <laughs> For the harshest and most complete slavery arises from the most extreme freedom, Plato writes in the Republic 564a. Since in the democratic city, all desires come to be seen as equal, the democratic soul can no longer recognize what is truly disturbing the balance of their regime. It's so puzzling because, 
They can no longer discern between good and bad desires. Now, the tyrant enters into precisely this disorder. Brilliant. Now the tyrant enters with a smile, Plato says. The tyrant comes in friendly, a friendly word to everyone he meets. It's like Joe Biden. <laughs> he promises to free everyone from their debts. I will cancel your student loan. <laughs> and to divide up the possessions of the city equally. He pretends to be universally kind and gentle. He wears Ray-Bans. <laughs> Yet he then proceeds to silence or eliminate any opposition to him that exists, Plato writes. Sorry, Plato didn't have the Ray-Ban part. Uh, Plato writes that this tyrant will then proceed, in his friendly, smiling way, to silence or eliminate any opposition to him that exists. And he will begin conflicts and wars abroad, which require a strong leader such as himself. Wherever free speech is exercised in challenging how he rules, the tyrant will either find a way to set its critics at war with one another, or will find a way to eliminate them entirely. Where the physician looks at what ails the body and tries to remove it, the tyrant tries to remove what is best in the body so that he can go on ruling. Now, Plato tells us that all of us have all of these desires within us. Uh, each of us have the desires of oligarchic man, democratic man, tyrannical man. And in some sense, Plato recognizes original sin. Any bad dream, Plato writes, will tell us that there is in everyone, a terrible, untamed, and lawless class of desires as we find a democratic man. For each of these types are nothing other than a certain kind of lust or passion which goes berserk and leads to another round of disordered desires. The self-discipline of thrift and oligarchic man, Plato observes, leads to greed and the lust of the power of wealth. And then more decadent desires buzz around and cause democratic man to surge to an enormous size, at which point he loses all restraint and becomes filled with what Plato calls a foreign madness, which in turn is how tyrannical man comes into being. The lust for the power of wealth gave way to the lust for liberty, gave way to the rule of the lust for power itself, which is to say, lust itself, what Augustine will call libido dominandi, following Plato. As Socrates says, lust dwells as an internal tyrant, directing the entire course of the soul. Tyrannical man is finally the perfect slave of this lust, and all of his opinions will be nothing other than the bodyguards of lust, an evocative phrase. By now, the exercise is exceptionally clear. There is a profound similarity between the desires of the soul and the desires of the city. What makes each of the regimes unhappy is that they are, are essentially uh, elaborations and determinations of an interior disposition gone wrong or gone berserk. It's not only the question of men who are like their regimes, but also that regimes become like their men or their worst men. This is not a politics is downstream of culture argument or vice versa, but rather it is clear in the ancient tradition in Plato as elsewhere that there is a kind of feedback loop between the soul and the city. The soul is political by nature, but the city also forms the soul. And so we see that the city is natural to man and indeed formed out of a movement that can arise in the human soul. And so we naturally tend to conform ourselves to the regime we find ourselves in. This is almost a principle of natural law, that the soul simply will conform to its city, uh, absent some higher city. This is intimate, this intimate relationship between the soul and the city, not uh, does not move in one direction uh, only. 
uh, does not move solely in a vicious direction. It can also move in a virtuous direction. Um, as anyone can see, Socrates is said to have said, there is no unhappier city than the one ruled by a tyrant. And I think we can safely say that America is a very, very unhappy city. Yet just as there's no unhappier city than the one ruled by a tyrant, Socrates also adds there is no happier city than the one ruled by a king. And these are the opposites, right? A king and a tyrant. So the king is one ruled by virtue and the tyrant is ruled by vicious passions. We must not be fooled by the outward show of wealth, equality, or grandeur that oligarchs, Democrats, and tyrants all can display, but rather we must look deep into the heart of man so that we can form a good judgment about which movements of the soul lead to happiness and which lead to unhappiness before we can provide a political judgment about our own regime. What is the difference between a king and a tyrant? Plato says it's principally the difference between how their passions are ordered. One is ordered by what is just, and the other is ordered by lust itself. This is why uh, in the reception of the city of God, in the medieval period, the medievals, when they read the city of God, they want to read book 14 of the city of God very carefully because it's all about the passions. Moderns want to read book 19, right, uh, for a complex set of reasons. Um, but, but the medievals knew that political analy analysis should begin with the passions, right? the order of the passions. At the end of Book 9 um, in the Republic, we learn that the just city, the happiest city, is laid up in heaven somewhere for anyone who chooses to see it. And seeing it chooses to found a city within himself. This is Plato's infamous philosopher king. The kind of king who sees the very heavenly form of the city, who makes the contemplative ascent to the one who is beyond all things, raised high beyond all things, to the form of the city. That is the kind of wise king whose contemplative gaze will make his own city happy. Plato essentially concludes then that the cure for tyranny is the wise and happy philosopher king who sees the form and who imitates the heavenly city. Fast forward from ancient Athens to ancient Rome. Like Athens, the Roman world was suffused with religious rites, shrines, altars, narratives about the movements of the gods in human affairs. Augustine grows up between two worlds, a pagan one and a Christian one, perfectly represented by his pagan father Patrick and his Christian mother Monica. In his famous account of his own conversion, he confesses his errors and sins and says that they were like sacrifices offered to demons on the inner altar of his heart. This, is, this analogy is apt in the soul because Augustine's profoundly aware that what binds the soul, what integrates the soul, is also very important to the city since the city is also held together by religion, sacrifice, worship, and a contemplative gaze which orients our action. Since Augustine lives in a world where pagan shrines abound alongside the shrines of saints and martyrs, it's easier to see that these exterior altars of the city are ones he would attend to and pay also close platonic attention to what's going on in the heart, his heart. After the sack of Rome in 410, many elite Romans had, uh, who had never accepted Christianization of the empire, who wanted to sort of turn back Christendom, as it were, from the reigns of Constantine and Theodosius especially, had charged that Rome was falling precisely because Christ and his church had usurped the place of the ancestral gods. Augustine writes his magisterial city of God precisely against these charges as his original title reflects, De Civitate Dei Contra Paganos, against the pagan contemplative vision. Augustine initially responds that during the sack of Rome, pagans and Christians alike found shelter not in pagan shrines, but in the great basilicas of apostles and the martyrs of Jesus Christ. Far from being bad uh, for Rome, Augustine immediately retorts that it is the church alone 
which gave sanctuary to Romans in their time of most practical need. That it was not Rome that made Rome happy in that moment, but the church. Augustine argues that Rome's fall is due to a corruption in the Roman soul, a corruption that was mediated by a false contemplative vision, mediated by the worship of not only wealth and power, decadence and greed, but the gods of the city who make them ambitious for the wrong ends and make their passions go berserk. Rome's problem, in Augustine's view, is a problem of the passions as well as a religious problem. Augustine narrates Rome's own history, therefore, from the vantage point of her gaze. What is it that Rome most looks at? worships, admires, adores, and how does that shape its public thing, its res publica? In this sense, he's asking an essentially platonic question, or if you will, Socratic question. What is the relationship between the contemplation of the soul and the actions of the city? If Rome seems in dire straits, if Rome seems unhappy, if its actions are decadent and its passions berserk, inclining towards self-destruction, as America's most certainly are, it stands to reason that this has its root in how Romans see their highest common good and their final end. It has roots in what orients their altars, both the altars of the soul and the altars of the city. It's for this reason that Augustine repeatedly uses a Latin word, spectare, usually translated as spectacle. I don't have my spectacles. Spectacles. Anyone with a passing understanding of Augustine knows that he's highly critical of things like the Roman games. He's very critical of gladiatorial games and very critical of stage plays. This isn't because he would trash Shakespeare, but because the stage plays were all uh, bringing the people's gaze upon the, the pagan narratives of interactions between humans and the pagan gods. These are spectacles, right? literally spectacles, the gladiatorial games and the, the theater which raised up the, the narrative of the gods and the interaction with human beings. Spectacles, uh, I suppose like the Grammys are spectacles, but, but not like we say the Grammys are really awful. Um, uh, they love the games. They love uh, the brutality of the games. They love the debauchery of the theater. And both of these were suffused with religion. Uh, our spectacles are also suffused with religion, but uh, that's for another talk. The games and the theater were not only circuses which entertained and thus formed the people, but they focused the Roman spectare. The, they focused the Roman gaze on the very Uh, religious objects uh, that disordered the soul and the city. Roman theater held up the immorality of the gods. They're always sleeping with uh, with, with one another and uh, indiscriminately uh, as either humorous or tragic. But Augustine said that the Roman soul is deformed by these spectacles not because he is against games or theater but because he is against how spectacles shape and misshape the city. In this sense, consistent with the Platonic insight about men who are like their regimes, Augustine now is attentive to a deeper question. Men who are like what they gaze upon. Men who are like their gods. We become what we contemplate. Let's see if I can stand up. Augustine personalizes the effect that Roman spectacle had upon him. When I was a young man, I used to go to sacrilegious shows and entertainments. I watched the antics of madmen gone berserk. I listened to singing boys. I thoroughly enjoyed the most degrading spectacles put on in the honor of gods and goddesses, in honor of the heavenly virgin and of Brasinthia, mother of all. This is book two, chapter five, if you want to look it up. Augustine knows the Roman gaze then from experience, and thus he knows the Roman city from the inside. He recalls the verbal and sexual obscenities performed 
performed in the theater and in the city. The goddess cults demanded that men castrate themselves, yes, sometimes with rocks, in order to preserve and serve the altars of fertility. Priestesses would perform sexually degrading rites in public that Augustine says in a domestic context would be unacceptable, but in the heart of the city became acceptable precisely because the gods authorized it and demanded it. He asks, who could fail to realize what kind of spirits they are who could enjoy such obscenities as dashing rocks against, well, you know what. The gods of the theater and the city are not our friends. They are not friends of the city, Augustine argues, nor are they friends of our souls. Only someone who refused to recognize that these spectacles which order our gaze, only someone who refused to recognize that these spectacles were in fact and could only in fact be created by unclean spirits, masquerading as gods, only someone who refused to recognize that would continue to behave in such a way. Only someone who refused to recognize that the contemplative gaze was wrong would want their lives so governed by a depraved cult, he writes. This notion then of spectacle is critical for understanding Augustine's argument in the city of God just as it's helpful for rethinking Plato. Elite Romans were often and famously not so attached to the gods as the people of Rome, noble lies, and whatnot. They, however, regarded, almost as Emile Durkheim would observe, that the gods are sort of essential for the working of the city. We need them. Some Roman elites held an attitude not dissimilar then from the noble lie view. And thus in some way not dissimilar from Plato's view, who would tolerate the gods. Even though he knew the gods were false, he would tolerate them, and this for Augustine is evidence of Plato's weakness, the weakness of the philosopher king to elevate the city, to protect the city from the tyrant. Augustine asks the tolerant Roman elite who thinks that the gods are perform this kind of pedagogical social function and their short force should be tolerated as we build the empire. He asked these tolerant Ro Roman elites why they tolerate having, quote, temples to demons where g the galley, uh, the galley were priests of the great mother, Sybil, long story. Uh, Temples to demons where galley are mutilated, eunuchs are consecrated, madmen gash themselves, and every other kind of cruelty or perversion. Book 2, chapter 7. Um, the gods and the plays which were largely about them had such a hold on the public imagination that it seemed reasonable to act in these ways. Romans were captivated by spectacles, Augustine writes, which spout lies, cruelties, and obscenities, all intimately ordered to the movement and the passions of the gods and the narratives about the gods. Their souls had become like their religion. So why does it not occur to Roman elites, Augustine asks, that the problem might not be Christianity, but Rome's gods, who are nothing other than human inventions puffed up by demons. Augustine commends them to read Plato, of course. He has a great pains to show them that Plato is theirs. Because Plato, at least, had the good sense to banish poets from his city to prevent their misleading the citizens with the divinity of the gods who demand stage plays in their honor. So the spectacles direct the Roman soul and the most depraved desires of the human heart are given a kind of divine authority, pride flags, so it follows that just as men may be like their regimes, the city becomes a reflection of the demons who order the city. He cites their own best men on this point to ensure that Romans know that the critique, or what is the phrase, the calls coming from the inside, 
the critique comes not just from without, but from within. Augustine cites Sallust on the moral deterioration he witnessed after the civil wars between the plebs and the, uh, and the fathers, noting that after, the time, after that time, after the time of the civil wars between the classes, remember Plato's remarks about the tyranny arising from class wars? Uh, after the civil wars, which were class wars, um, after that time, quote, the degradation of traditional morality ceased to be a gradual decline, he writes, and became then a torrential downhill rush into immorality, like America. The young were so corrupted by luxury and greed that it was justly observed that a generation had arisen which could neither keep its own property or allow others to keep theirs. This is book two, chapter 18. He knows nothing about America. <laughs> Augustine sets out his thesis very clearly before Roman readers when he writes, quote, Rome had sunk into a morass of moral degradation before the coming of our heaven, heavenly king. For all this happened not only before Christ had begun to teach in the flesh, but even before he had been born of a virgin. 218. The bishop will not allow the Roman elites this luxury of blaming others for the decline that they experience, and especially not to blame it on Christianity. He forces them to face their own history squarely through their own revered authorities and histories, as we must do. It is not only a defense of the city of God, it is an examination of the Roman soul. Not only did their gods not protect the Roman people, they guaranteed the torrential downhill rush into immorality, leading Rome itself down the metaphysical scale into the pits of self-destruction. There you see the Roman Republic, Augustine writes, changing from the height of excellence, virtue, to the depths of depravity, 219. As he puts it, quote, the worshipers and lovers of those gods imitate their criminal wickedness and are unconcerned about the utter corruption of their country, 220. Imitation then thus remains central for thinking about the relation of the soul to the city. Men who are like their regimes and regimes who are like their gods is central to the question at the heart of Western civilization. Augustine rails against the way in which materialism and libertine hedonism in Rome are simply human performances of the debauchery of the gods. Romans root their moral code only in consent, Augustine writes. Again, he knows nothing of America. Romans root their moral code only in consent, and like, as Aristotle understood, this fuses oligarchic and democratic man into one great tyranny built on lust. Augustine summarizes Rome, Rome's radical libertinism thusly. Rome's motto in his view, get as rich as you can and let people do whatever they desire as long as there is consent. Could we have it on America's bumper sticker? But consent-based morality develops, Augustine says, into a society turned in on itself and tends to punish anyone who speaks for a higher, more transcendent standard. As if speaking for many Christians in our late liberal empire today, Augustine laments that to stand opposed to this bad religion because of the disorder it introduces into the soul and the city alike invites only derision, cancellation, exile, it's a threat to the gods. He writes, anyone who disapproves of this kind of happiness, Augustine's capable of extraordinarily sardonic asides and sarcastic replies, like Adrian Vermeule. Anyone who disapproves of this kind of happiness should rank as a public enemy. Anyone who attempts to change it or get rid of it should be hustled out of hearing by the freedom-loving majority. He should be kicked out and removed from the land of the living, 220, city of God. So far, so devastating. Rome is enslaved by bad religion, which has disoriented the interior altars by the deceptions of demons and thus has in turn degraded the city. 
Augustine destroys the gods of the theater and the gods of the city alike, he leaves intact the philosopher's god. He leaves intact at least the philosophers who are lovers of wisdom such that they might rise to the knowledge of the one true God. He's especially complimentary at times, though very critical as well, to the Roman philosopher statesman Cicero, who he praises for directing Rome to that complete justice, which is supremely essential for government. Cicero sees that a republic should be bound together by a common sense of what is right, which is to say a shared view of morality and the common good, and bound by the common interests, loves, purposes, and ends of a people. But Cicero laments that instead the republic has fallen far from the standard. Cicero says in Scipio's voice, what remains of that ancient morality which supported the Roman state? We see that it has passed out of use into oblivion so that far from being cultivated, it does not even enter our minds. We retain the name of a commonwealth, but we have lost the reality long ago. And this was not through any misfortune, but through our own misdemeanors and faults. There was, in Augustine's view, a fancy picture of the glory of Rome, just as we often hear conservatives present a fancy picture of America. A fancy picture which doesn't really hold up to the scrutiny that we see all around or even that we can see in history. The fancy picture of the glory of Rome stands in stark contrast to the degraded reality which was evident even to Rome's greatest patriots and heroes and thinkers. By the end of book two of The City of God, Augustine returns to the importance of spectare, what we see, what we look at, what we love. He writes that Rome had not been formed by the fancy picture it had of itself, but rather it had been formed by Roman spectacle, which made the passions go berserk. By acts presented before all men's eyes for imitation, to put forward for them to gaze at, he writes. What then can we say of Plato's philosopher kings? What then can we say about them? Their contemplation of the eternal form of the city did not lead to the purification of Rome. It was not Cicero or anyone else who saved Rome. Augustine admires the philosopher's God, uh, the philosopher's attempt to understand uh, the cause of all things, that raised high beyond all, all things. He admires the Neoplatonists, Plotinus and whatnot. He admires Cicero. He even admires Varro on some level for his description of religion. But all of them, on some level, are either going to collapse God into the soul of the world, as he says Cicero and Varro do, or their contemplative vision isn't going to be strong enough uh, or capable enough to denounce error. Plato still tolerates the gods who disorder the souls, who disorder the city. So what good is your philosopher king? contemplating the one beyond all things. Platonists truly order their contemplative vision, right, to the transcendent God, to the final end, to the supreme being above all being, to the wisdom of God. Augustine will admit all those things. The Platonists do that. He even tried to do it. He talks about it in the Confessions. He tried to do the Platonic ascent, right? His disappointment, though, is that the Platonic ascent doesn't hold you you behold, but you are not held. Right. You fall back. And so does the city fall back, even with the help of the philosopher king. Socrates had taught that the soul must be purified to enjoy the contemplative vision of the one cause of all. But the Platonists don't get purified. They tolerate the gods, Augustine says, because they're still too impure, as we all are, to be united to our cause. The philosopher king 
cannot save Rome from tyranny because they cannot purify themselves in the light of their gaze. And so Augustine turns, as you will expect, to Jesus. Jesus is the one who purifies on the altar our hearts and our cities. He can purify the soul and so unite us to the eternal city, but the political consequences are not far from Augustine's mind. Certainly the only way to crush false religion in the heart is by true religion, but so the only way to crush false religion in the city is also by true religion. The only way to safeguard the soul and the city alike then is not by way of the philosopher king, by way of reason, high Kant. The only way to safeguard the soul and the city from the torrential downrush, downhill rush into decay and immorality is to redirect both to the interior and exterior gaze of Christ. Augustine ends the second book of the city by contrasting two spectares, contrasting two gazes, contrasting the degrading gaze of pagan bad religion to the elevating Christian vision, which raises people up to a truly transcendent standard and holds them there. There is the yoke of polluted powers met by the Christian purge. And this might be seen as the whole aim of his work in the fifth century, the Christian purification of the Roman Empire. True religion, then, for Augustine, can only make men who are like the heavenly city, and in making men who are like the heavenly city elevates the earthly one. This view reigned absolutely supreme and unquestioned right, for over a thousand years until we got to John Rawls. Final part of my talk, a tyrannical creed of unhappiness. Today we see that the gods of the theater and the city have come back with a vengeance, return of the strong gods, as my friend Rusty puts it. So too have the gods of oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny circling souls around a new false faith set on destroying God and the image of God. Many have written about the Great Awakening. I've he heard woke mentioned very t various times. It's something which both taps into America's Puritan and evangelical traditions, but also something which represents a kind of new civic religion to replace the old more consciously Protestant Christian civil religion. We see the new solemnities. Plato says, you know, the, they got to introduce new, the tyrants got to introduce new solemnities. We see the new solemnities being introduced all the time, everywhere we look. We look. The positivist Auguste Comte was foolish to introduce a rationally mapped out secular calendar for France. What he should have done is started the internet and controlled our calendars to roll out new holidays one by one, getting corporations to celebrate them all. That would have been the real clever move. Cancel culture, as I think Will mentioned, is but a mechanism for this, a mechanism for establishing the new solemnities, a mechanism for disciplining and redirecting the gaze of souls. In order to exchange one civic religion for another, one must exile, discipline, punish, cancel all the old solemnities, all the old images of the person, all the old images of the, the natural goods of marriage, sexual difference, somewhere Deborah is here, sexual difference has to be, uh, complementarity has to be, uh, that image, uh, the beauty of male-female complementarity, that image has to be stamped out for the new solemnities to come into being, uh, uh, essentially, of the family and especially of the church. You need to break the bonds of all the old loves in order to forge the new ones in the civic soul. Today, we regularly see all these images, um, which would have been unthinkable even a decade ago. 
uh, we see images of men dressed as women who ascribe disordered desires even to children who they treat as sexual objects during drag queen story hours at libraries and now schools and everywhere you go. Ever increasing levels of disordered gazes now normalized where evil desires are called good desires as spectacles for public consumption. These are instruments, instrumentalities, if you will, much like the new priests and priestesses of Gali, forming souls to be like the self-destructive city that pulls down the ramparts. The pride flag, which was just flown at the U.S. Embassy uh, to the Holy See in Rome, is as good a symbol of the new rights as any. There's several. The city that flies the pride flag celebrates what? The human will. Celebrates the omnipotence of the human will to decide what's good and evil. This city purports to celebrate equality and human dignity of all people. But this claim itself is incoherent. The equality of human beings can only be affirmed if we have some objective standard in which we're all considered the same. And what would that be for the entirety of the human race? What would be the objective standard in which we could all be said to hold something in common? Then you can talk about equality. But if the constitutive nature of our, of our being is simply our will, we have nothing in common. Just billions of tyrants. The city of pride, which celebrates itself this month, doesn't have a theology fit for the recognition of equal dignity. That would require an anthropology that understood that each of us were equal by virtue of our common cause, and that our dignity was elevatable according to the end and purpose for which we've been made. What the city of pride celebrates is an anthropology of transgressive difference, which cannot celebrate God as prior to us, as the uncaused cause of a nature we all share in common, but rather celebrates only the tyranny of passions gone berserk. Individual desire is an originating cause of self, sex, gender, identity. This is not only capricious and rootless for our city, but the community or the city it forms is itself vicious and tyrannical upon our country. It's for this reason that St. Augustine calls pride libido dominandi, the lust to dominate disorder. He describes this as a spiritual disp disposition that disorders everything. He sometimes refers to it as the city of man, but what he really means is a disordering principle that establishes itself in the city and soul alike and is a feedback loop for destruction. It's more to think about the pride flag as an anti-politics Patrick Deneen's phrase, than a politics proper because it's actually depriving people of their own proper goods, blinding them to the ends which would elevate and protect them from tyranny. The Promethean attempt to construct the self according to our deceptive gazes then through distortive mirrors leads to the misrule that we now suffer and are made unhappy by. Divine providence permitted that June be celebrated by this city as Pride Month. We see the pride flag everywhere, which is to say we see the pagan religion. We see the court religion of the liberal imperium, and we're asked to make an offering. What would Augustine tell us? He knew nothing of America. What would he tell us? Well, he was a bishop, so he might tell us something very simple and biblical at first. He would tell us that basically what St. Paul tells us, right? Not to be conformed to this world, but to direct our gaze to Jesus Christ, who alone can form the soul to be like his eternal city. But I think he'd also tell us something else. After the biblical authoritative text comes the responseo. 
he would tell us something, I think, about certainly the limits of Plato's philosopher kings. Certainly, the, he would be critical of the idea that liberalism would be some philosophical system that could turn back the clock and save you from tyranny if we could just get back to the founders. He would dismiss that immediately. He would dismiss any attempt to arrive at some contemplative bulwark against the sicknesses of soul and city alike that did not present us with the adhesive power of Jesus Christ, the purifying power of that altar that should be set up in the heart of our towns and cities and countries. He would remind us, I think, of the promise and limits, but certainly the promise of Christian rule according to the standard of the obedient city above. I think this is evident in Book 5 of the City of God, and I'll, I'll conclude with some reflections here on Book 5 of the City of God. After recounting the disorder and happiness of Rome, he returns to the question, not of despair that we live in a polity that is disordered and unhappy, but the question was, well, what would make us happy again? What will make Rome happy? He's not, you're screwed guys forever. In the 19th chapter of Book 5, he answers the question directly. What would make Rome happy again after all this unhappiness? He says this, As for those who are endowed with true piety and who lead a good life, if they are skilled in the art of government, then there is no happier situation for mankind, for Romans, than that they, by God's mercy, and then I'll say these dastardly words that he writes, should wield power. Surprising? Though it is God alone who gives power to Julian the Apostate and Constantine alike, Augustine thinks it's inarguably happier, not happiest, but happier, for a people to be ruled in ways which see by the light of the one true God than those who see only by the shadows of false religion. It is for this reason that Augustine finally turns to his famous speculum, or mirror for Christian princes. He writes, very famous passage in book five, uh, establishes the whole uh, Christian tradition of a mirror of princes. He writes this, it's a long passage, but worth it. When we describe certain Christian emperors, rulers, uh, literally princes, but emperors, as happy, it is not because they enjoyed long reigns or because they died a peaceful death, leaving the throne to their sons, nor is it because they subdued their country's enemies or had the power to forestall insurrections by enemies in their own land and to suppress such insurrections if they arose. All these and other similar rewards or consolations in this life of trouble were granted to some of the worshipers of demons even, as is their due. And yet those pagan rulers have no connection with the kingdom of God to which those Christian rulers belong." End quote. Augustine averts that the Christian ruler does not look to material goods, to mere temporal benefits as the highest good for polities, does not think that it's the economy stupid. But rather, he writes, we Christians call rulers happy if they rule with justice. If amid the voices of exalted praise and the reverent salutations of excessive humility, they are not inflated with pride, but remember that they are but men. If they put their power at the service of God's majesty to extend his worship far and wide, if they fear God, love him, and worship him, if more than their earthly kingdom, they love that realm which they do not fear to share the kingship, if they are slow to punish but ready to pardon, if they take vengeance on wrong because of the necessity to direct and protect the state, and do not satisfy their personal animosity, if they grant pardon not to allow impunity to wrongdoing, but in the hope of amendment of the wrongdoer, 
if when they are obliged to take severe decisions, as must often happen, they compensate this with the gentleness of their mercy and the generosity of their benefits, if they restrain their self-indulgent appetites all the more because they are free to gratify them and prefer to have command over all their lower desires than over any number of subject peoples, and if they do all this not for a burning desire for empty glory, but for the love of eternal happiness, and if they do not fail to offer to their true God as a sacrifice for their sins, the oblation of humility, compassion, and prayer. Ah, this, this is the kind of Christian emperor we call happy. Happy how? Happy in hope during this present life and to be happy in reality hereafter when what we wait for will have come to pass. 524. This is his speculum regum, his uh, sometimes called the speculum principum. Augustine, ever the realist, doesn't place the standard so far out of reach. The standard is immediately applied to two emperors in particular. The speculum is applied to Constantine and Theodosius. These two emperors in particular, Augustine sees as Christians who were happy emperors, not because they did all the right things. No, they're not idealized in this world of trouble. But these two emperors are ruled out particularly because of the religious aspect of their rule. The first emperor he names as Emperor Constantine, he writes, God in his goodness heaped worldly gifts such as no one would have dared to hope for upon Constantine, who made no supplication to demons. It's the first praiseworthy thing about him is he didn't, he didn't, uh, it's the first rule on your, on your, um, your campaign pitch, I will promise no supplication to demons, but worshiped only the true God. Augustine praises God for Constantine, for, praises God for granting to Constantine the honor of founding a city, namely Constantinople, which contained not a single temple or image, he says, of any demon, but of course he means the pagan temples were crushed. All the pagan temples were crushed by Constantine in Constantinople, not in Rome, unfortunately, that would wait for Theodosius. If this is Augustine uh, shying away from the command for Christians to establish uh, the proper altars of the city, then I don't know what to, t to tell you. He's very clear. Augustine speaks clearly about what he admires in rulers. The second ruler who unites the speculative to political action is Emperor Theodosius, of course, about whom he has uh, much more to say than he had to say about Constantine in Book 5 because he witnessed Theodosius at close hand. He's his contemporary, or nearly. At least he had living memory of the man because he witnessed the way Theodosius used his power um, to help the church against the ungodly by just and compassionate legislation just as his speculum commends. Theodosius greatly expanded Constantine's Christianization of the empire, much to pagan chagrin, and helped the Catholic Church by removing support for Arian heretics, yes, by coercive temporal power. He ordered the demolition of pagan images, knowing that even this world's prizes are not in the gift of the demons, but in the power of the true God. Most know, of course, Bishop Ambrose had condemned Theodosius to penance for his crimes against the people of Thessalonica. Double S's always get me. But what Augustine notes is not that Theodosius failed to rule justly. In fact, Augustine takes great pains to actually praise Theodosius for his penance. What's remarkable about Theodosius is that he takes correction from a bishop. Don't call it integralism. He has no illusions about the Theodosius' failures. None. No illusions about his failures to rule justly. What he did in Thessalonica was wicked. 
the bishop called him to repentance. And Augustine praises him for that. He writes that nothing could be more wonderful than the religious humility. Always religious humility for Augustine, you could just have it in shorthand in your mind, that always means penance. It never means, oh, I'm, I've prepared you know, this meal and it's not very good. That's not humility for Augustine. Humility is penance before God. It's the recognition that God is prior to us and that we owe God a debt. That's humility. That's what humility is, concrete penitential humility. He writes, nothing could be more wonderful than the religious humility Theodosius shows before God, certainly, but also Bishop Ambrose after a grievous crime, end quote. Augustine heaps then the highest praise on Theodosius, more than he heaps on Constantine. Because he's more glad to be a member of that church than to be a ruler of the world. And so he's more glad to be corrected by the church. 526. This is precisely what America needs. It needs Christians who dare to wield power. Now maybe that wielding of power will just be in Steubenville, Ohio, and that's okay, right? But maybe it'll be more than that. Maybe those who wield power um, will be trained right here at the College of St. Joseph the Worker, and they might rightly order their souls and so help America to become happy again, or happy for the first time. Thank you.